Thank you everyone for joining us for another week of 120 Dublin Stories with Santa Rita and the Little Museum. So our guests this evening, just to introduce you before we jump into this conversation, tonight we are joined by Professor Thomas Laff Sola, who is the chair of the Best in Heritage Conference, which we're going to look forward to hearing all about. And uh, Thomas Laff was recently described to me as one of the best minds in the world of museums. So we look cool. forward to the conversation. So, Thomas, thank you so much for being I'll stand here. Up with that. <laughs> and our second guest this evening is Mark Leslie. Um, Mark is one of the pioneering exhibition makers within the world of immersive design here in Ireland and the director of Mark Hello. So, Mark, thank you also for being here. My pleasure. Well, thank you both so much. And um, to everyone who's joining in with us, thank you for being here. If you have questions as we go through the evening, please do type them in and we'll very happily ask Mark and Thomas Laff. But Thomas Laff, just I'm going to come to you first. Um, I'd love you just to start us off by telling us a little bit about the Best in Heritage Conference. Well, uh, like anything we do, uh, uh, it's, it probably comes from a certain frustration. Um, I was very much associated with the uh, European uh, Museum of the Year Award and uh, there I, after a certain while, started to uh, hold innovations, didn't work and I thought, you know, uh, there was a uh, look at the light. Full. Uh, so frustrated uh, because there was, a, there was a rising number of awarded projects, you know, museums new or renovated. Uh, reconceptualized and uh, they would get uh, international awards or European awards, uh, uh, international awards and so on. And, and uh, I thought, you know, it would be just a good idea instead of uh, rather despise the theorizing and museology and whatever, especially in the Anglo-Saxon world, uh, I thought you know, it would be good just to uh, have them all together, you know, to tell the uh, success story of success, you know, and why was it that they, they were proclaimed the best in uh, in Scandinavia or Europe or uh, Japan or uh, Iceland, Ireland or whatever? In fact, you know, it worked so well actually because it's very simple. It hit, it hit only uh, uh, as a solution my frustration, but also uh, frustration of the others, you know, because if you win uh, a title of best museum in, uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, of course, you would say yes if somebody invites you to tell your success story, you know, and, and ask you, you know, uh, please tell it to uh, the audience of uh, 150 from 35 countries, you know, why were you proclaimed the best in Europe? You know? mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't have money to pay them, of course, you know, and they would come uh, upon on, on their own uh, uh, just to say, uh, uh, spread the, the fame, you know, to say, yes, we are proud of it. And so we were actually spreading the, the, the good word, the good fame. Uh, it was altogether the best uh, endeavor, you know. So uh, now we are 20 years uh, there, and obviously uh, that very same reason. Uh, if you like it, you would say uh, it's, uh, you know, spreading the professional excellence. If you like it less, you would say, oh, well, it's just pride, you know, and it's... Uh, it's sort of uh, you know self praising and so on, but it's it's really uh, we have seen it and and, and uh, Mark Mark would know uh, very well because he, he was there uh, quite a few times uh, out of very good reasons, as you would guess. Uh, it works because it is a good transfer of professional excellence. You know, uh, mm -hmm. if you want to do your job better, you know, you go to professors at university. At, uh, who t tell you, you know, how to make, make it better, or you go to your colleagues who said, uh, we've done it already, you know, just, uh, you know, have a look and maybe you would get inspired. And that was finally the word that really colored all our uh, uh, action and our event, you know, inspiration. So it worked, yeah. Very much. Okay. I, I'll have to comment. Uh, it is a fantastically useful event mm -hmm. because all of us, none of us have the time to keep pace with what's the best going on, you know, around the world. And to have Tomislav and his team filter on top of a filter, all these different organizations, you know, the Slavic League of Museums or the Nordic Leagues or the UK Museums Association, 
have an awards event, filter their very best projects. And then Tomislav brilliantly brings all of these award winners, both in museum design, exhibition design and often just heritage projects, you know, a restoration of a building or an amazing archeological dig. So it's not too narrow, it's quite Catholic and broad. And then brings the professionals or the, uh, the museum curator or the museum designer or the archeologist together in one place where everyone gets a chance to see all of these, you know, it's the best of the best mm. to just to be there. You don't enter, you're invited, mm. but it distills the essence of whether you agree with it or not, what is happening on, you know, five or six continents of the world. And all of the people involved in these amazing groups are all there in the one place, in the very intimate atmosphere mm. of, you know, beautiful Dubrovnik, uh, God be with the days when we were allowed to travel, but you know, uh, and, and hopefully we will be able to again in in a wonderful ambiance where it's 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 a sort of three or four day continuous street party almost, you know, in Dubrovnik with people saying, "God, I never even I've heard all about this museum. I'm so thrilled to meet you," or "I've never even heard of it," and I'm even more thrilled, you know, uh, and to have the people present their own work. Uh, it's just the most uh, wonderful and rewarding event. And we're hugely privileged that for one reason or another, I've got to be at it, you know, four or five times. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and certainly even in, you know, when I come to retire from this game, I'd still want to, I, I'd still not want to miss the best in heritage. Yeah. And it is, it's, um, I, I know that the findings and the kind of the knowledge share that comes from the best in heritage is something that we've had the, um, the good privilege of bringing home to the little museum as well and I think you know Mark I'd love to just ask you about this um th this kind of idea of e exhibition design so as we've we've mentioned you obviously have are, are, are running a very successful career as an award-winning designer and curator of exhibitions and I kind of wonder if you can kind of distill them down would there be a couple of key principles that you would really see feature within your work? Yes, well, I kind of blundered sideways into this whole uh, area. You know, I'd studied history to get into Cambridge University, but what I wanted to be was an architect. Mm -hmm. And it took me quite, a, you know, at least a decade to figure out that architecture in the 20th century had just become packaging. You know, we weren't building the 20th century equivalent of sort of Gothic cathedrals unless we were Calatrava or, you know, no or whatever. Um, uh, and that there was a career called um, interpretive uh, mm -hmm. master planning that allowed me to combine my skills that I'd learned as an architect in spatial planning with my love of history. And the fact that I come very fortunately from a long line of men of letters, you know, for 400 years, my family in Ireland have been, um, it's an old fashioned term, not clever enough to be a super specialist academic at any one thing, be it architecture or museology, we, we too much butterfly minds. But within the heritage interpretation, there was room for butterfly minds. You know, we, we, we don't write the, um, the definitive tome on, you know, American ornithology or Greek archeology, span mm. but my grandfather, Shane Leslie wrote 50 books on everything from ornithology to you know Irish politics uh, hated by the real academics because his pot boiler redacted book written from reading their academic tome would be a bestseller whereas what was in their book was really important but it wasn't communicated to the public and of course the whole thing of museology is communicating complicated ideas to the public but one of the great principles and it was only through things like Best in Heritage that I realized there were people like Tomislav and others and people involved in organizing European Museum of the Year or whatever, who thought deeply about what is the nature, what are we trying to do with museums? And really said it's not, you know, we've all been to the sort of conference, you know, I remember going to a conference in Dublin where a very distinguished Irish museum curator said, when people ask me the story, you know, I reach for my pistol, it's all about the collection. Mm -hmm. But the museologists of the 20th century have had to say, we are public historians, it's all about people, 
and it's all about I, I, Thomas Slav will correct me which, which one of the you know the museum scholars said it's it, a good museum doesn't tell you weigh you down with too much facts or information it creates an ambience where people think deeply about something they hadn't thought of before so I always say my great principle when I design an exhibition or I design an immersive multimedia or an interactive, I'm trying to do what that great school teacher, we've all had one or two teachers who inspired us, made us interested in something we didn't think they were interested. And the way they did it is they gave us the jigsaw puzzle pieces, but they let us put it together and they kept left the keystone do mm -hmm. you say, oh, you're with, I think I get it. I, 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 I see what you're getting. Everything was a problem solving. They mm -hmm. didn't tell you, they posed you questions and yet gave you the tools to come to the Eureka moment. Mm -hmm. And a good, ex a powerful exhibition leaves, has sufficient interactivity, poses questions rather than solves them. You know, we've all been to the County Museum that tells the whole history of Ireland on wall panels. You know, and you miss the key point for the overwhelming information. But anyway, I'll, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to Thomas Laughter, perhaps. I, I actually did. Um, I, I found a quote that Thomas Laff, you, um, you wrote, which says, success consists of a solution for the needs of the community because museums are not there to solve the desires of the, uh, the desires or the meaning of the museum business. Um, I, I, I wonder if you actually, as Mark was saying, would you just talk a little bit about what you see the role of the public being in driving forward museums? Are you asking me? Mm. Oh yeah, because I, I wasn't sure. Uh, well, I, I might have written that because uh, I've, been, I've been writing very much or, or probably too much sometimes, I think. Um, uh, the point uh, that Mark is in, uh, either saying directly or, in, uh, or uh, um, uh, indirectly is that it's not about us. We are, uh, if you wish, demagogically, uh, uh, we are servants. But literally, we are. Uh, any professional is. Uh, that's the true nature of professionalism. And when I was fighting for professionalism in museums or heritage, uh, domain. Uh, what I had in mind was this, not, you know, uh, fascinating other colleagues, but the number of the footnotes or, or you know, vastness of, of the knowledge and insight into uh, God knows what uh, scientific perspective uh, uh, is involved, you know, because it's not that what matters in our job. Uh, uh, of course, knowledge, of course, uh, all these things, you know, because it, it is scientific, uh, uh, science-based, mm. but science is not uh, the aim, it's just means. Mm. Uh, and unlike uh, university professors, which I was at the time, of course, and I was apostate, I was uh, heretic and so on, because uh, formerly, before that, you know, I was a museum curator and director for 15 years, but I came over there to uh, spread uh, the, uh, the uh, gospel, you know, and the gospel was uh, public is there, we are the servants, you know, and it's about the past, you know, and if they face it, they're not sure what to think about it, especially with all others involved, imagine politicians and all others, you know. Mm -hmm. So I was dreaming all the time about uh, an independent grand profession of heritage curators, not museum curators, not librarians, not uh, archivists and so on, but the real profession which would be in charge of what Mark is, uh, uh, is mentioning, sort of, uh, he didn't use the term, but I would, uh, uh, public memory. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very, very significant uh, uh, responsibility. Uh, you can certainly deal with that on, on very low levels, I mean, low by, 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 uh, by the smallness of your community or, or uh, you know, a certain problem that you locate, uh, the problem of the community that you would like to help solving and so on. Uh, uh, but it works on all levels, you know. And uh, I tend to think now with uh, conspiracy theories being so widely uh, popular, you know, I think we are not allowed to, uh, to spread as a profession, perform as a profession, not by some curious guys sitting at the mahogany table, you know, 
Because it's not about that. I think real uh, the conspiracy is uh, probably in our minds because we think that we, are, uh, we shouldn't do it or probably it's too dangerous or it's too difficult or whatever. It's just responsible. And uh, when Mark is doing his job, uh, may I uh, uh, praise his job because uh, uh, it's them who turn ideas into, uh, uh, into stories and into talkative uh, matter um, or the facts, you know, as he was saying. Uh, uh, he's implying exactly that, you know, and he is part of that profession. That same part, of, that same way of thinking. Uh, and of course, uh, I couldn't do anything much. In fact, the, my books would not be that uh, well praised, you know. But I did find my own way, uh, partly through the conference, and it was uh, subversive in a sense, if you wish, but in the best possible way. You know, learn, you know, and learn from the best, you know. And when Mark comes over there and, and other people who are inspired and really hot about the, 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 the job they do uh, and the engagement uh, and the successes they have uh, actually uh, made, uh, and you see them doing it and you see them recognized by the others, you know, you say, my goodness, you know, I should imitate them at least, you know, or, or, or uh, be less timid with my own fascinations. Mm -hmm. Because uh, um, it's not very likely that you end up in a museum as a museum curator or in the library uh, because you, uh, I don't know, uh, love it incredibly, you know, uh, you know the dust of, of the sculptures or, or whatever, you know, uh, the dark corners of your museum. It's certainly an urge to communicate finally, you know, whether you know it or not, because otherwise you wouldn't be there. You would be uh, just a, a professor somewhere in, in an institute and probably, you know, uh, getting through the finals uh, for all of the life, not facing your know, public. Uh, mind you, uh, the first curators I have met as young curators were just like that. When I was volunteering for an uh, for, uh, education officer, what was uh, at the time not really named like that, uh, my fellow curators laughed, literally. They said, oh, you want to be a, a, a guide? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, like, uh, like Italian guide, uh, you know, guiding tourists. Um, what was the name of it? I, uh, 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 it's Italian, uh, Italian uh, specific name for that. We'll come uh, to that uh, later on. They didn't understand. They thought, you know, uh, we are, scientists working in, in a public institution, but it doesn't work, actually. If you just think it over, it doesn't work. You, you, uh, that's finally, uh, let me conclude this part uh, uh, to uh, be briefer. Uh, that's finally the definition and the whole meta. At one point, with the marketing coming in, uh, we were forced to uh, say, what business are we in? And we were unable to say that. Because if you say to the marketing people, you know, whom you expect to help you, and that you are in science business, you know, what the hell are you doing in the museum and what, why and how, you know, who would be minding your job? Uh, but then if you, if you are brave enough to say, we are about communication, uh, whom, what, and, and what is the, finally, what is the product? And then you are in serious business and that's really curatorial, curatorial job. Mm. And it's, you know, it, it's fascinating and it's funny I think kind of defining who your organization is and what it does is really important and it's um, I think you know the little museum it took us a number of years to realize that we're proudly in the hospitality business and that is a key part of who we are as an organization and I think there's um, that's an important thing for us to articulate um, but Thomas Love you mentioned this idea of community and Mark I just I'm thinking about the Lace Museum, I'm thinking about the Kavanaugh Museum. These are a number of projects that you've worked on over the years where the local community has been really instrumental and indeed has fought for these projects to succeed and has been really kind of at the heart of it. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your work. Well, my, you know, having done grand projects like GPO 1916 or the, you know, the Churchill exhibition in the Morgan Library, uh, it's really liberating to work for these small community projects because these people are so passionate, so motivated and so knowledgeable 
about their local hero or heroine, you know, and I've been very lucky in the last year and a half, even with lockdown, to do the uh, Mariah Edgeworth exhibition in Edgeworth Town, tiny little schoolhouse exhibition, but the community group live, breathe and eat Mariah Edgeworth. And there we are, one, perhaps one of the greatest, the greatest woman writer, you know, in Irish history, and nobody's they ever heard of her, you know, in her lifetime, she inspired Walter Scott, she inspired um, who's uh, Jane Austen, you know, she inspired them to start writing and she invented the, the modern European novel where people speak in the vernacular tongue. She's out of fashion at the moment. She'll be rediscovered, no doubt, hopefully some academic will write a giant tome on her. Patrick Kavanagh, you know, who had to walk from Inneskeen to Dublin, you know, because he didn't even have the bus fare to prove his genius to the world and eventually did. Um, and yet that tiny little village, population 164, has for 30, guts of 30 years, maintained and operated with no resources, you know, <laughs> minimal funding, kept a great big church building and a secretary going. And when we thank finally Monaghan County Council said the generation that set this up are fading away. And we said, we need to bottle their knowledge and wisdom before they go. So these, are, these people need to be interviewed and encapsulated. And we need to create something very respectful to everything they've done before using the technological knowledge, because we have a lot of whiz bang, you know, interactive multimedia. We have a, a, an immersive free projection space that uses drone technology to fly you through the places that Patrick uh, Kavanagh wrote about and somehow integrate their very simple mm. but truthful primitive exhibition, which depended more on the passion of the tour guide bringing you around and that's always the best interpretation uh, a passionate local person who knows and loves his subject and just, just as the lace museum in uh, clonus you know there's a skill that is fading away crochet lace making that kept that whole village of clonus alive during the famine they have all died half the village died of hunger but the other half survived through lace making and yet there's the last you know they've been supplanted by machine technology and yet this they can sit there chatting right with a cup of coffee whatever there, and just using the tension of the lace threads on their glove be uh, crocheting in a glove in three dimensions without even looking you know and to capture that on film and have them talking about it so that the knowledge of what they did of what they read is preserved ever is hugely is a huge privilege because I go to great big institutions and they don't really know what the motivation of what they're trying to communicate in a way. You know, oh, it's a it's an archaeological museum. We have pot shards. We want to tell people all about the taxonomy of pot shards. And I say, that's very curatorial. Actually, they don't want to even know about pot shard taxonomy. They don't want to know about the taxonomy of pots. Mm. They want to know about cooks. What you're trying to convey is something about the human nature of the people who created these, you know, pot shards. We did a science museum, uh, in, again, very lo locally based in um, Cork, you know, Blackrock Castle Observatory. And the passion of it is upstairs in the castle are real scientists actually writing the software that detects the flickers of light that says an exoplanet. And when I went to the, oh, look, we've got all these amazing techniques and the software and, and it's all about um, we can detect incoming asteroids and we can detect that there's exoplanets going around other stars. And when we started that project, there was only about 100 exoplanets that had been discovered. Thanks to the software written by bearded boffins in open toed sidles in that tower, we now have 5,000 exoplanets. You know, we could discover our future, you know, the next Earth, the next inhabitable planet. But I had to say, look, what you're doing, nobody cares about the technique, really. It's the motivation. It's you've got to convey that to get your funding, you need to explain to the government that whether we are alone in the universe or whether the universe is teeming with life, you will soon discover one way or the other. You, you, you know, 
if we discover 100,000 planets and there's life on none of them, almost certainly we're alone. And that is so important. What does that actually, what you're really conveying is, this is an incredibly important thing to know, because if we're alone, what does it say for our stewardship of one planet? If this is the only little speck of dust in the universe that has life on it, and we're about to screw it up, that is, you know, <laughs> people have to know. Equally, if, but au contraire, there's billions of worlds out there, and even if a tiny fraction of them have life, just statistically, some of them will have evolved way beyond us, and some are way beyond us. Imagine the shock to our culture. We've got to be ready and braced for the fact that there is a civilization possibly near us in our own galaxy that is a thousand years ahead of us. And think how the Polynesian, their whole culture collapsed when they came in contact with a civilization 200 years. Mm -hmm. But there could be people out there a million years ahead of us, a billion years. And almost certainly when we encounter these life forms, if they, if they are there, all of our religion and science will crumble to dust as nothing. So you need to be bracing our, because we're the first people we know of on this planet who will have the technological to answer this astonishingly important question. The world has to be culturally and philosophically ready to accept our insignificance or that we are supremely significant as the only intelligent life force in the cosmos. And they all looked at me and said, oh, really? Is that what we're doing? I said, yes, that is what you have to communicate, not the scientific techniques that you thought the museum had, because it's life, what your museum is called is life on Earth, you know, life in space, man's place in the universe. That's a very grand thing to be thinking about, to communicate, you know. Um, and it's that um, principle of getting people to strip away the facts, the information. It's not about information. It's not even about knowledge. It's about wisdom. And if your museum is not provoking wisdom by making people even argue or think deeply about something, but you're just swamping them with facts, mm. you know, uh, you, you'd be missing the point. Absolutely, and it's you, you. You have such a beautiful, kind of excitable way of telling stories. You just, I, I want to be there, and I want to be experiencing it right now. But um, when when you talk about this idea of wisdom, uh, Tom Slap, this comes back to kind of a subject that's kind of at the heart of your own research. I've got a term, um, which I'm potentially going to pronounce wrong, and I apologize if I do. And um, Minasofi, you did an essay on the science of public memory. Can you uh, tell us, uh, first of all, how do you pronounce the word correctly? What does it mean? And tell us about it. Mnemosophy. Uh, Mnemosophy. And, and it's really curious, you know. Uh, 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 I've been the one actually uh, uh, to thank the world for the occasion, you know, to know the human nature, because it's, it's really curious. Uh, if making museums or teaching or whatever, you actually learn so much about uh, human nature. Um, you yourself, you had uh, this little difficulty, you know, uh, um, pronouncing mnemosophy, and yet almost daily or, you know, once a week at least, you, you say mnemo technique or a mnemo something, you know. Uh, um, of course, you know, it's all about game. Uh, any term in science is a convention. So if we say science six, we all agree what the content is, uh, so it works. But I wanted to offer uh, a science uh, as the base of this profession I was talking about. Uh, and the science that what would be by the name telling the whole story. And curiously enough, in, in Greek, uh, which is somehow the basis of this this culture of ours, mind culture, uh, you have Mneme, uh, which, which is memory, and Sophia, which is always wisdom. So it's a, a memory which is so refined and so responsible and morally grounded that mm. is actually more than knowledge, that is wisdom. And if you have something, if you're concerned with the memory which is so refined to 
be more than knowledge and actually the wisdom uh, you have a bloody big and important thing to do in your life or in this transfer of collective experience that Mark is implying. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's all about that. And curiously enough, I've, I've even uh, written a book uh, which is, uh, 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 you know, Mnemosophy, an essay upon the science of, uh, of uh, uh, public memory. Of course, you know, uh, in 200 copies, uh, as far as we can reach for the, for the benefit of, uh, of the visitors in the public or, or participants. I don't imagine, you know, I will reach far, but uh, my idea was clear, you know, I don't even insist that they, uh, my colleagues appropriate it. I just want to show them direction, like a battery, you know, as, you know, there's the solution. Mm. And uh, the thing is actually, so uh, uh, beautifully, beautifully simple. Uh, I know who likes my words now. Kenneth Hudson, uh, you must have heard of him. Uh, a great man, uh, my mentor. Uh, I was lucky. Because you see, there's something completely wrong with museums uh, as, as traditionally they are. Because how on earth can you conceive logical that you go out, you know, to a village, you pillage everything they have, you put it in a museum, ethnographic, ethnographic museum, you say, oh my goodness, you know, we've saved the culture, you know, because it was endangered. Of course it is, you know, for the last 200 years, you know, as, as, you know, as we paced up uh, our development. You know. And this is how a modern museum came, uh, came about. But the curious thing is, you see, we save it only if it's there, mm -hmm. if it's working. As, uh, uh, sorry, Mark, I will again refer to your words, you know, uh, uh, if the community lives it, if the pottery is done for different pottery, but the, the knowledge and the wisdom of the, you know, the former, if you put it in a museum, isolated from them, you know, hell, you know, you have something probably for tourists, you know, but who needs them? I mean, tourists are just bonus, they're, they're just fine. But you don't do anything for them. You know, do it for your own people, and the best tourists will immediately grasp, you know, that it's best for them as well to know what people appreciate uh, as the story about them, mm -hmm. as, the, you know, the conveyed knowledge or experience of that particular community, or if you wish, even a national culture. Mm -hmm. uh, there's everything wrong with all that traditional or conventional museum, museums, you know, literally everything. Uh, or, you know, so much is covered, you know, by the, by the, by the, by the glossy uh, uh, outer picture, you know, by the glory of it all, you know, because there are public buildings, you know, and they're so significant and, and important. And you, of course, you feel important if you get to a, a, an important national museum of your nation and so on. It's all meant, of course. There's ultimately nothing wrong with that if you do the rest of the job. And the rest of the job was never done. Never done completely, never done enough. Mm. And uh, I, uh, I will hate if, I, if, we, if, we, if we leave uh, this uh, occasion of, of, of chatting uh, together without mentioning uh, the formidable revolution of eco museums, which is another mentor of mine, uh, Georges-Henri Rivière, who, who said, you know, uh, museum, uh, that's the, uh, you know, museum's interpretation point of the territory of a certain identity. And that's the whole story. You know, get to the point where you can learn about it, but as the life, you know, as the real museum or people's life. You know. That's the, the whole matter. And we, we were serving uh, entropy, you know, uh, in, this, in this chaos, we were, we were forming small, small area of, of safety, you know, everything's fine here, you know, like uh, telling, uh, trying to explain to David Attenborough, you know, that uh, all is fine if we have one coral reef left, you know, because all is there, you know, it's nothing. We need, we need the system working. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's what it's all about, you know, and um, if museums can remain this kind of wisdom and this kind of influence to communities, uh, to the society, then the job is being done. Mm -hmm. If not, you know, I just, uh, you know, I don't know, Crying in vain and probably being uh, self-indulgent uh, about it because, uh, yes, according to a certain tradition, uh, 200 years long, uh, long, you know, 
You're right. I mean, you're right as a, as a conservative uh, uh, curator. Why not? You know, uh, even tendencies, which which is why I wrote the book, another another, another one, which was completely dedicated to the critique of museum uh, practice and theory. Not because I thought I would be writing it, but because what I saw was, was frightening. We were we were re uh, reiterating. We were, we were going back. Uh, and this is happening to the entire modern society. Not only in museums, we have certain tendencies which are backward, you know. Uh, we have the civilization of, of societies. My goodness, what we, what we find in certain societies is, is literally turning, turning uh, towards the past as our own reality, you know. Uh, and this is very much helped, uh, uh, especially in certain countries, uh, by politicians and so on. Now, I don't imagine that we will change the world, uh, but if we stay uh, just, you know, uh, uh, calm and do nothing about it, we, if we don't try as a profession, uh, uh, we should be uh, uh, to be blamed, you know, as others are. And now uh, I hope uh, there will be a moment to, to mention uh, uh, the crisis of the, of the modern world and uh, all the, the dangers. You see, uh, uh, Two years ago, maybe, and I will finish with that. Uh, uh, in, in Italy, uh, uh, there was a try of privatization of museums, public museums. Everything, everybody was up, absolutely appalled by the idea. It's it's somehow being installed little by little into our minds as a possibility. You know, why not private uh, private and, and public partnership? You know, uh, about public memory. Oh my goodness! You know. And be sold? Is it an asset? You know, everything has to be an asset because we, you know, we're pushed into it. You know, it's a crisis. You know, for God's sake, don't insist. You know, don't be uh, you know sort of a uh, uh, you know difficult guy. You know, it has developed. Whereas development is something which is very much connected with, uh, to what uh, Marco was mentioning as wisdom. You know, uh, it's for the long uh, periods. You know, in advance. Uh, you don't do something today, you don't protect something today uh, for today. It's uh, with some mind, uh, you know, something on your mind. By the way, I, re I remember the, what I was proclaiming when I, when I volunteered to be a guide. They said, you want to be a Cicerone, you know. But disregarding this pedagogical sort of communication part of the scene so much that they would despise it even by the expression. Cicerone is something, somebody, you know, you know, uh, guiding British tourists uh, and telling them, you know, that uh, at every corner of Rome, you know, somebody was killed, you know, and the emperor fell down and so on. Nah. So, sorry, uh, I, feel, <laughs> I, I get, like, get uh, like Mark is, uh, I get involved, you know, easily. I feel like quoting the immortal Mrs. Malaprop, uh, one of the great comic creations of uh, Brinsley Sheridan, the playwright, saying, we should cease our introspection on the past and save our introspection for the future. <laughs> or, or um, uh, who what was the other great Irish bull about, uh, I can't remember, one of the great parliamentarians in the 18th century, famous for his, uh, I think Sir Jonah Barrington, who said, why should we do anything for posterity? What has posterity ever done for us? <laughs> okay. But yes. In terms of that, giving an example to uh, how you convey complicated concepts by letting people think around the subject and then come to the conclusion itself. Again, back to the example of Blackrock um, Castle Observatory, uh, we had the notion of putting a um, pangalactic email station in. Now, we could have told the kids the reason why the universe could be teeming with life but we've had no sign of it, is because it's incredibly, incredibly big. You know, the stars are incredibly far away, and even galaxies are unimaginably. But the way we conveyed it was, do you know, kids, press this button to find out how many discovered exoplanets are in line of sight of the actual radio telescope on the roof. And they press that, and it would give them an up-to-date star map. So, do you know, five of them, five of these stars, are in line of sight of our exo. Right? So think about what you would like to radio to planet Zog that would persuade ET to come and visit you here in Cork. 
So the little girl would think, oh, well, my, you know, we're friends with animals. I have a lovely cat called so-and-so. And my mum would give us cream tea. And they do a whole ad for come and visit Earth. And then they would genuinely press the button. The radio telescope would genuinely log on to star X orbited by planet Zog. And the message would zoosh off. And they think, great, job well done. E.T. will be here soon. But the covert message, the overt message is, Earth's quite a nice place and maybe we should be friends with the aliens or not. You know. But the covert message to get across that point is don't expect an answer anytime soon because the video screen would show the message saying three to half a second later, we're going past the moon and in uh, 17 minutes we'll pass Mars. And if you stay looking at the screen for four years, you know, as we accelerate towards the speed, right, we'll pass Proxima Centauri in about four years' time. Oh, and by the way, planet Zog is 194 light years away. So we'll email you in 194 year, light years to show uh, your message has got there. And do join us in 362 years to see if we get the reply. And meanwhile, on the screen, we've shown the galaxy, Milky Way galaxy, and say your message in those 300 years will have traveled four millimeters across that map of one galaxy. And then we shrink the galaxy, shrink them all, shrink them all away to specs. And there's just billions of galaxies. Back away. And the kids feel they've had a constructive thought about, should we have the aliens here? Why, what might attract them to come? Should we be friends and all that? And they philosophically thought about it. And without telling them, they've tweaked the reason why, you know, ET, why there aren't UFOs landing in their back garden every day of the week, because it's the quarantine of the unimaginable space-time distances involved. But we haven't had to use any big long words like that, you know, and they've spent a lot of time thinking, what would they do to welcome E.T. to their house in Cork, you know, but at the same time they've grasped the essence of the issue, which is just the immensity of space-time means we may never find out, you know, we may never encounter them. Okay, and just lack of seeing them doesn't mean lack of existence, but equally we can't take their existence for granted either. So a whole lot of complicated thoughts have suddenly been implanted, seeds in their mind. And in the meantime, the, the sponsors of the exhibition, the scientists, have said, well, at least the next generation of kids will have some mm -hmm. sense of the importance of our work. And sure enough, schools in China, because they later got hold of Cork's, I think, a 90-foot telecom dish that Irish telephone company had decommissioned. And they said, well, we can send even more messages more often to more planets, so we can do more tracking. And because of our doing an expo in China, we were able to tell Chinese schools about this. So the downtime of the telescopes and the court children aren't tracking. They're making friendships on Earth oh. with people in China because they can share that radio telescope. You know? And so the real solutions to all of these problems is human collaboration oh. and like-minded endeavor to discover the truth. Truth. Well, that is a problem, yes. You know? um. so, it's uh, it's beautiful and Mark, I I'd love to go from aliens and ET over to castles for a moment, if you'll indulge me. And um, Mark, uh, your um, ancestral family home was the beautiful castle Leslie, and I kind of I, I was thinking about it during the week, and I kind of wonder if if walls could talk, what stories do you think that castle might like to be telling? Well, you've hit on a yeah a very key motivation. Uh, because obviously the world is full of conflict. Castle Leslie is an artifact of the brutal, you know, Anglo-Irish <laughs> domination of Ireland. Uh, we're quite proud as an Anglo-Irish family. I'm quite proud that I had the great privilege of presenting the story of 1916 for that great celebration. So Ireland's VE Day, finally, a hundred years later, we had our kind of victory over England, great festival, uh, saying, you know what, the whole struggle was worth it. But what I'm proud of, like the arms dealer who sold weapons to the Croatians and the Serbs, 
I was also doing the Apprentice Boys of Derry Siege Museum, that both sides of this very extreme divide trusted uh, myself and my colleagues to tell both their stories simultaneously. Because again, what we wanted to do, while we had this slightly awkward negotiation of telling Billy Moore, the head of the Apprentice Boys of Derry, mm -hmm. saying, Billy, your story is a very important story because we believe that all of the political forces in Ireland are moving in the same direction down the road of liberty and freedom and people having responsibility for their own political future. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, you need to know that my family were Protestants, but fought on King James's side at the Battle of Boyne. Ah, sure, we'll overlook that. Well, yes, we were proud of that because with hindsight, the Protestant the Glorious Revolution of 1690 cleared the way for the thinking behind the American Revolution of, you know, 1760. A lot of Ulster Protestants said, if we can execute one king for being the wrong religion, why do we even need kings at all? And he said, hey, well, we want you to tell that how important, you know, the Ulster struggle was in sowing the seeds of the American Revolution. Good. We can agree on that. And that, of course, led the way to the you, uh, to the, uh, the American Revolution led to the, uh, the um, volunteer movement in Ireland, looking for parliamentary democracy and the building of our Parliament House in Dublin. And that in turn led to a split between the Orange Order you know, and the United Irishmen. But all of them, whether they knew it or not, were moving in the direction of making people responsible for their destiny, people being responsible for their form of government. So whether you're orange or green, Catholic or Protestant, you're all just on the same road. Some of them are a bit further down the road of liberty and democracy. Some people are still, you know, have gone as far as constitutional monarchy. But in direct political terms, Jerry Adams is the secret love child of William of Orange. And he sort of gasped and said, well, I suppose we'll have to tell that. Good, we can do business. Thank you. Very, very happy to tell you your side story. And I'm very privileged in that because I come from an Anglo-Irish background, who've managed to be on all three sides of every political struggle there ever was in Ireland. And we have a castle that the state straddles the border. Even now, people go up there because they think they're going on a jolly holiday or a riding holiday, not realizing how many negotiations in, in the 400 years that we've lived there, of secret meetings between Michael Collins and De Valera, or between, you know, the Reverend Ron Bradford and, you know, Sinn Féin. Uh, and we've been very proud of the fact that we've had this sort of bridging role, putting people together. But in my genetics, I have a double role. My, on my maternal side, Jewish Hungarian grandfather with his Aryan Protestant German wife, you know, fled to Britain. So I'm at the moment writing the roots, the seeds of my life, saying conflict resolution to the east, Germans and Jews, to the north, Catholics and Protestants, to the west, two generations of my family married Americans who are of partial Red Indian descent. And much to my delight, I've discovered I have black African DNA because I have a unique illness that you have to have black African genes to do it. And I thought, where did that come from? And then I realized, of course, of course, the Jerome sisters, famously Winston Churchill's mother and Winston Churchill's aunt, my great grandmother, were shunned in American society for being mulatto. The rumor was at the time they were of mixed race blood. And that made them unmarriable in America, but highly because of their mulatto beauty and strength and their famous Jerome Constant, highly marriageable in England. Mm -hmm. So the delightful irony of history is Barack Obama takes Winston Churchill's bust out of the White House, says we don't want him, not realizing he's the only British prime minister with African-American blood because the Iroquois tribe, who he proudly acknowledged as antecedents, used to receive any number of black runaway slaves and said, Jesus, you know, those whites are awful shits. Join our tribe. Welcome. You know, <coughs> it's fine. So the delightful 
ironies of history where nobody is who they think they are and we're all completely interconnected. I even found the Balkans, which I thought I had no connection with, and one of the first visits that I did with uh, Tomislav to look at some interesting projects in Zadar was to visit the Castle Leslie in Petuigrad Castle in Slovenia, home of Count Walter Leslie, who knew, you know, we'd never heard of him, uh, who turned out to be, you know, my nearest sort of antecedents. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my passion at the moment has been driven by the, the lunacy of Brexit, you know, that here we have finally a positive attempt to put the European family of nations together, which solves the Irish problem, which would solve the Balkan problem, you know, the tragedy of the loss of Yugoslavia, where you had Serbia, Croatia, Macedonia, Slovenia, all in one country. And the only way that part of the world makes sense is if it's economically one and yet preserves the very powerful national identities of all of those nations. And the European Union has yet to fulfill its was in, in, in taking the powder, powder keg of the Balkans by putting it back together because it sort of economically flourished as the Turkish Empire, it economically flourished as the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It sort of economically functioned after a fashion as Yugoslavia, but Europe provides a way of everybody winning. You know, the, 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 no, the Serbs don't have to dominate the Croats and, and the uh, British don't have to dominate the Scots or the Irish or the Welsh. And it's just my great relief that my beloved Uncle Jack, who was a very popular figure here in Ireland, fought heroically with the Irish Guards, he was thrown under the bus at Dunkirk, survived five years in a German prison camp. And what made it all worthwhile, he said, every nation in Europe has shed so much blood. The Leslies, the male line of the Leslies, in common with almost every family in Ireland, have lost members of the family in the uh, Louis XIV wars, in the Napoleonic wars, you know, 40% of the soldiers at Waterloo and 40% of the British were Irish soldiers. So much blood was shed, First World War, Second World War, and I'm the first generation of my family not to have to fight or lose a limb or go to prison in a land war in Europe. And it was heartbreaking that the British discourse on this never mentioned that the primary reason for it is to make sure there is never a Sarajevo moment again. Um, but Uncle Jack said, I just love the fact that having done five years in a German prison camp, I can walk from the north of Scotland to the south of Greece and it all belongs to me. I'm a citizen of all of this. And so, you know, my mission in perhaps my old age is to kind of write a book that helps my, you know, friends and kind of having been educated in Britain, been to university in Britain, to try and see, you know, is there any chance that you might think again? Because this pandemic, we've known about it for 30 years, we've been warned it. How much bigger is the global crisis of the environment? And how can we hope to solve what is a global problem if we can't even keep Europe together, you know, as, as one federal collaborative unit. So there's really big things to be thought about. Issues that this, our survival of the survival planet uh, depend on. And that's why it's so important that museums, you know, carry on stepping up the plate, making people think about these very deep issues of identity and, you know, global scientific uh, futures uh, because of the times that we're living in. And when we did, uh, we, we're very proud of some work we've just done in the Carrot Macross workhouse, where we take all those terrible statistics about the millions of Irish dying of pestilence and hunger and the terrible mass migrations without really thinking through, actually, we're living in an age of pestilence and mass migration and destruction now. And it only dawned on us when we said we would take the human real story of one person, Rose Sherry, who actually existed, survived three and a half years of the famine in the workhouse, and under the Earl Grey scheme got shipped to Australia to deal with the gender imbalance, that there were four women, four men for every woman in Australia, and the British came over and hoovered the Irish workhouses of nubile teenage girls willy-nilly and chucked them to Australia. Now, because there is a God, they were rewarded by being in Australia in time for a gold rush. 
and most of them became immensely wealthy and happy and far better off than if they'd stayed in their native island. But while making the animation, the workhouse people showed us the burial pits where 5,000 people had been just shoved in 12 deep into death pits. And as we were making that part of the animation, we just turned on the television news and saw the bulldozers on Staten Island bulldozing New Yorkers 12 deep into graves. And I thought, oh my God, the past is not some other planet that we can never visit. History is sort of circular, <laughs> circular and where the very horror of the story we were trying to convey in the Irish Run is very easy to convey now, because we're living it. Mm -hmm. We're living in global pestilence, you know. Definitely so, a, a anyway, message. on that cheerful note. <laughs> on that cheerful note, I um, on that cheerful note, I actually I want to ask you, Thomas. Up, um, when a moment ago, Mark said the words um, "global" and "hope." which are two words that I would associate with the Global Love Museum project. And I, I just, I think it's, it, I think it's beautiful. And I kind of, I would hope that you might tell us a little bit about it. <laughs> oh, well, uh, thanks for mentioning one of my fascinations. Uh, uh, I'm living all my life, uh, although I've been traveling a lot and living uh, outside of my country for a while. Um, I've spent all my time uh, on Balkans, as uh, uh, Mark was mentioning the countries. So, uh, um, in a sense, like Mark is uh, a walking museum of his family, a walking museum of, uh, of a historical time uh, that saw so many troubles and changes, uh, not for the best all time. Uh, one of the things I would like to say, because I think our, our time is uh, running out, uh, is uh, that I particularly like, like something about uh, uh, Castle Leslie. Uh, uh, and that uh, was uh, a small detail. Uh, in one of the rooms over there, uh, uh, apparently uh, I'm relying upon, uh, upon what I was told by Mark, uh, Jonathan Swift spent the night as a visitor to the castle and the family. And uh, uh, I would support your heritage for a, a little moment uh, because uh, I uh, admire several geniuses uh, uh, in the human race. One of them is uh, uh, Jonathan Swift. And please return to the reading. Uh, I have, uh, I think, five. Uh, uh, different editions uh, all over uh, a long span of time. Uh, and I can tell you, uh, most of them uh, popular ones do not have uh, the last chapter, uh, uh, which is painful one, which is about Yahoo's, uh, where horses are people and uh, people are actually uh, savage fools. And uh, uh, I uh, strongly recommend to uh, the audience to return to uh, Jonathan Swift, Gulliver's Travels, and read the, last, the fourth chapter. It will be a, a rather sad, uh, uh, sad uh, uh, inspiration in a sense, because uh, he's not very optimistic about human nature. And very frankly, neither am I because uh, I thought uh, we would be doing better. Uh, I'm uh, uh, occasionally lecturing now uh, because I, I took first, first chance to retire because I think this, this we uh, ought to do uh, to uh, the younger generation because, you know, people wait for the job. Uh, but uh, I left a few of my, genera uh, my generations of students behind me telling them that I'm really sorry and I apologize for leaving, being one of the generations that are leaving uh, the world uh, in a worse state than we have found it. And it is the truth, uh, you know, uh, we may less starve from the hunger, at least uh, in this part of the planet, uh, but uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, humanitas, uh, in terms, uh, terms of uh, uh, human condition, in the sense of it, you know, I think uh, we have uh, uh, we have graded, in fact, 
and uh, the deficits we are uh, we are witnessing right now are not encouraging at all. Uh, it's typical that uh, any older person with the colored world, uh, especially that of the future, which he or she will not uh, uh, have the pleasure of enjoying, uh, uh, color it uh, in dark colors, you know. Uh, but I'm not the one. Uh, I have my own children, and I'm very concerned. Uh, and it's not just rotten idea, you know, a uh, better world for our children. I mean, in all honesty, it, it should be better, you know, because we've lost our time and we are losing our time. Uh, uh, I will return to David Attenborough because uh, uh, recently I read a book and uh, saw the series, everybody knows about it and so on. He's finally you know, optimistic at the, at the end, you know, but uh, uh, out of, uh, out of uh, I would say, uh, gentlemanship, uh, out of uh, a noble mind and uh, with an aim to encourage us. But there's a little of, uh, a little argument for this optimism. Because as you see, uh, Mark is, is talking about Europe. Europe is, uh, is falling apart. Uh, uh, I'm very much part of it. I feel uh, terribly European, uh, but I'm not served well as a citizen because uh, it's not a Europe with, uh, with its own destiny in its own hands, you know. Uh, it's, uh, it's not a coherent continent, you know. We see blooming naturalisms, we see, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's falling apart in, in the sense of of spirit, you see. Uh, many years ago, at one lecture, which was one of those where I really failed to fascinate my, my uh, uh, audience in terms of, you know, uh, uh, telling them what they want to hear. I told them, the Europe that I have in mind that has any future should be formed upon culture. What was Mark also implying? Upon the feeling of Europeanness. Uh, uh, the shared the shared heritage. If that cannot be done, there's no basis because economy is greed, ultimately, especially in the libertarian society. You know, so you don't build any unity upon it. And uh, uh, politics, my goodness, who have has built a, a, a unity on politics because you know what politicians want, so having their masters, of course, you know, in cooperative world, they would uh, they would have more job to do, you know, and, uh, and more guarantee for their careers if we stay separated and grew, grew uh, uh, in, in further separation. Mm. So um, we are talking about the sanity. We're talking about honesty uh, uh, on, on, in, in basic terms of human, human condition. I always imagined and allow me this uh, idealism and naivety, uh, which is uh, certainly intentional. Uh, I thought museums, uh, uh, libraries and archives uh, would start to function as a, as a sort of a, a, a mega brain uh, serving the wisdom, not photography. You see, the drowning in knowledge, especially in data, especially in information, especially in, in, in oceans of un unnecessary information. Uh, no less and to judge uh, more poorly uh, things which are essential for not only our communities, but also for the entire planet or uh, entire you know, uh, cultures and so on. And it's, it's a gloomy prospect altogether. Uh, that phenomenal wisdom that Mark is, is mentioning is absolutely not there, especially not very much coming from museums. We have brilliant museums. We are, uh, we are, uh, we organizers in Dubrovnik are, are uh, uh, much rewarded uh, uh, when we see those uh, and hear those stories over there because they are the best part of it, you see. But, but the, the real uh, harsh reality of it is uh, what you have in all other countries. You know, when I criticize museums, uh, let me say that, you know, which is, it's very, very common uh, human experience. Uh, uh, many of my colleagues, you know, get uh, get rather, uh, uh, you know, frowning and, and offended and so on because uh, they immediately think, you know, it concerns me. No, it concerns the rest, the majority, 
because the majority of museums think about Afghanistan, for God's sake, you know, they have the right to have museums. You know, would you even mention the name museum, term museum over there? Uh, doesn't make sense because they produce opium, you know, and they produce opportunities for, uh, you know, uh, uh, international, if you wish, uh, uh, military uh, industries, industry sector. You know, that's the uh, uh, role for the last 15 or whatever years. And look, you know, in Af Africa, you know, and so many other countries, South America and so on, you know, there are beautiful examples of uh, uh, museums of, of uh, communities, uh, museums of uh, a barrio, you know, of the quarter uh, in certain cities and so on. Beautiful things which uh, uh, finally the civil society, you know, are blooming. Uh, even uh, just uh, encouraging signs that so many things are possible mm -hmm. and they are within reach actually. But then you are prevented, prevented by lack of money and there'll be less and less money over there. There'll be, there will be more and more of disregard for the professionals because as you know, even in England, uh, they will be discouraged from you know, getting employment in museums because they cost too much. And then technicians would probably suffice because, you know, cost less and so on and so on. This is degrading the entire task, you know. And it's not about us, you know, it's about me or some other fellow curators. It's about the huge matter, which is public memory. What do we do with all that past, you know? To serve what, you know, to be what today and uh, what uh, tomorrow? And it's, it is a huge question, it makes sense. It's the same thing as Attenborough is saying, of course, you know, easily uh, demonstrated on something that we all know as our environment, degrading daily. Mm. And like in environment, you have the museums, you see. In environment, we build up to certain areas, you know, we declare certain national parks and so on, spots in the, in the harsh reality where we create the illusion that things are saved or are better, you know. But in fact, you know, they are just, you know, isolated places like our museums. The rest is, you know, uh, uh, the culture which has been de defeated, uh, which is uh, not producing itself anymore, uh, reproducing, it's, it's, it's dead. Right. And finally, you know, we find it in the, the museum glass case in this way or another. But mind you, uh, and this is important, uh, seeing uh, the nature uh, uh, and, and uh, the culture as asset, uh, it's not an invention of our time, of course, you know, but uh, it will be much as a problem, much supported by this horrible crisis. This is pushing us down economically, and it will be uh, a huge excuse for all sorts of insulting uh, retrograde uh, development, meaning that we, that museums will be forced into uh, uh, into uh, all sorts of uh, rotten deals. Mm -hmm. We are there to tell the truth and to be honest. And I will end up with, with my mentor's words, you know, when he was uh, uh, talking about criteria or what a good museum is, what is the best museum? And he was talking, of, uh, and I made uh, several attempts uh, of lecturing upon it, you know, an honest museum. Mm -hmm. and, he, and when he said that, he was actually meaning the same uh, uh, little secret, you know, how do you def define an honest man? An honest person, an honest museum, an honest institution. My goodness, we don't have many of them. And uh, that is, however vaguely described, a huge task to be done. We're trying to do it in the public. We're trying to do it as professionals, as, as Mark is trying to do in his design and his uh, audiovisuals, which are remarkable, by the way. You know, he's, he was translating the, 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 the poet in such a way that it was uh, another poetical uh, uh, experience I, so i thank you mark it was excellent uh, I, oh, I think that's sorry i have to end that because i think we're really running out. <laughs> yeah we we have passed the end of the evening and um, but i do think that idea of the the honest museum and having you know having open conversations asking questions and pursuing answers is probably what the next chapter holds and um, i think i got through maybe 1% of the questions I wanted to ask you both this evening. I, I think I easily actually could sit here for the next six hours and still have questions I wanted to ask you both. So I think 
incredibly that is the, set, the end of this evening um, I have really thoroughly enjoyed having you both with us um, I, I dare say I would be quite happy to invite you back for a second edition where I'm sure the conversation would happily continue but um, to you both sincerely thank you so much for taking the time this has really been very fascinating this evening and um, to everyone who's joined us thank you so much for your time okay. your comments and um, really? see guests coming in talking it's, about their experiences of um, evenings in Castle Leslie and I do see someone has written in going any chance of a second evening so I might if you'll indulge me invite you back to continue this conversation but um, for now Mark Leslie and Thomas Lap uh, Sola thank you both so much for joining us for this week's 120 Dublin Stories with Santa Rita and the Little Museum. Thank you Sarah. Um, keep dancing. Yeah thank you for in these grim lockdown times, thank you for facilitating chance to just see the face of a, of a dear friend. You know, uh, yes, we, yes, indeed. May we get back to a world where we can actually all see each other for real soon. Yes, yes. I'm looking forward to that. Sarah, let's uh, continue to talk uh, at least in the public hall at dinner and uh, at ease. I would love that. So thank you both so much. And Likewise. Thank you for the conversation. Bye.